denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from a ghost town on Route 66, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll follow a team of police as they investigate an old abandoned house that may not be abandoned after all. This story is called, We Got a Call to Investigate a Vacant House, What We Found Will Haunt Us Forever, by Rehayachem. The McCullen House stands three miles outside of our humble town. The four-bedroom, white farmhouse home was built by Hiram McCullen in 1929, shortly after he was elected as county judge. At one time, it was the cultural hub of local politics. Everybody who was somebody in our city would go to be fated by Judge McCullen and, in return, would open their pocketbooks to ensure that the jolly fellow was elected to another term. My great-grandpa, a county commissioner, talked about how extravagant and gaudy the parties were. My goodness, was that house a spectacle, he would say. Unfortunately, time is undefeated. The house became a decrepit wasteland after Judge McCullen died in 1978. The judge had no living heirs and left the house in his will to the county, and, much like the regular folk living here, the house was soon neglected. It now sits on a hill and rots from the inside out. The fluorescent white paint has long lost its luster, and is almost fully chipped off the walls. Most, if not all, of its windows are broken. Years of water damage cause the house to lean to the left, as if it hangs its head in shame. No, the McCullen is no longer the place for white linen soirees. It is, however, the perfect place for mischief. We got the call from Sonia Morris, that a stranger was poking around in her flower beds at night. I sent Deputy Stevens to respond, figuring that Mrs. Morris was afraid of her shadow again. Sure enough, Stevens found a man in his underwear digging through Mrs. Morris's trash can. He chased the emaciated man through the woods before the man disappeared into the McCullen house. When Deputy Stevens stepped up on the porch he noticed a foul stench that could only indicate one thing. He then pulled his radio up to his mouth and radioed me. Uh, Captain, I think I may need some backup. I arrived at the scene with deputies Corliss and Howard about ten minutes later. Stevens was dry-heaving by his squad car. Sorry, Cap. You know I'm sensitive to smells, he said. Corliss turned on his flashlight and went around to investigate the back. Howard followed me. The odor smacked me in the face as I took the first step onto the porch. My eyes instantly watered, and I reached into my pocket to pull out an old face mask. I banged on the door twice and yelled, Sheriff's Department, open the door! Silence. I knocked again. Sheriff's Department, open the door now! Silence again. I readied my shoulder to burst the door when I heard someone scampering down the staircase. I leaned down and opened the dusty mail slot on the door. When I peered inside, I saw a scraggly, middle-aged woman crouched at the staircase's bottom. Spindly wet hair clung to her head, and she wore nothing but panties and a tattered undershirt. She glared at me with an almost zealous hatred. Go away, piggy! You will die here! She seethed. Ma'am? I said, shaking. I need to inform you that you're currently trespassing. Can you come outside and talk? We can help. The woman, now shivering, bolted up the stairs and around the wall. Oh, Jesus Christ, Howard muttered. Okay, Bill, I said to Howard. Let's go in. Stevens, go check on Corliss. 
I turned the doorknob, but it broke and rolled off the porch. The smell was the first thing we noticed. There's no other smell in the world quite like a decomposing body. I'd compare it to a rotten egg mixed with spoiled meat and perfume, but even that doesn't do it justice. Stevens and I first encountered a dead body when old Lyle Tucker passed from a heart attack alone in his motel room. We found him two weeks later. It took an eternity to get that stench off my body, and sometimes I even smell it in my dreams. What we were about to find was far worse than we could have imagined. We ascended the staircase in silence. Besides creaks, the entire house was eerily silent and devoid of light. We then heard muffled voices arguing with each other. They came from the room at the end of the hallway. Sheriff's Department! I yelled. Come out with your hands up! Now! The voices stopped, and we heard more scampering followed by a door slamming shut. I signaled to move forward, and we marched toward the room. Before Howard could kick down the door, it flew open, and a naked man lunged at him. I pulled out my baton and thwacked him on his arm, but he was unfazed and wrestled Howard to the ground. Oh, fuck! Get him off me! Howard yelled. I smacked the man a couple times again, but resorted to my taser to put him down. Howard handcuffed the guy while he was still convulsing on the ground. Jesus Christ, Cap! I think this guy was covered in shit! I looked closer at the man, now fully conscious and gnashing his jagged, filthy teeth at us. Sure enough, smeared all over the junkie was his own feces. Stay with him. I'll find the other one. I entered the room with my service weapon pulled out and shined my flashlight around the walls, revealing a tiny closet. As I got closer to the closest hatch, I heard deranged whispering behind the walls. Ma'am, if you're in there, I need you to come out now. The mumblings continued, this time getting faster and louder. Ma'am, this is your final warning. Get out now. Leave this place now. A deep, curdling voice screamed at me. It hardly sounded human, and my heart began pounding. Meddlers will be persecuted. I took a deep breath and kicked the closet door down before jumping backward to give myself some space. Silence and stillness followed. I gulped and undid the safety on my pistol. Ma'am, come out with your hit. Before I could finish my command, the woman on the staircase leapt from the darkness and charged toward me with a knife, screaming. I fumbled with my gun, but Howard put her down with his taser before I fired a shot. The woman crumpled to the ground and writhed in pain. Howard quickly leapt on top of the junkie and cuffed her. I took a deep breath and leaned against the wall. Thanks, Bill. Jesus, what a night. When was the last time we had some fun? Bill chuckled. Haven't seen any action since that biker fight in 08. I shook my head and rubbed my temples, trying to forget that I'd almost shot someone. My radio buzzed. Uh, Cap? It was Corliss. I forgot that he and Stevens went in through the back. Go ahead, Corliss. My radio buzzed again after a brief pause. You're going to want to see this. Howard took the junkies to his squad car, while I went downstairs to the basement to meet Stevens and Corliss. Another junkie they arrested was handcuffed, face down on the ground. Stevens was interrogating him. Corliss led me into one of the back rooms in the basement. Large streaks of dried blood were sprayed over the walls. Large round candles were arranged in a circle around the floor. 
In the middle of the ring was a dead young woman wrapped in an old bedsheet. Her corpse was already beginning to bloat. Welp, I said. That explains the smell. Our coroner and Sheriff Wheatley arrived minutes later to pick up the body. Sheriff Wheatley shook his head and lit a cigarillo. Well, shoot, Pat. Looks like Mrs. Morris finally called us out for something real. Wheatley sighed and took a long drag. Okay, let's go book us them junkies. We hosed the three cretins to sober them up and eliminate their stench. Stevens escorted them into different interrogation rooms. We started with the man Stevens and Corliss arrested in the basement. His name was Travis Aubrey, a meth-head redneck from East Texas who had a rap sheet longer than his toenails. We talked for a bit after we gave him a cigarette. Said he joined the other two, a couple, near Houston. They planned to rob some convenience stores and make enough to score big. What about the girl? Wheatley asked. Travis shrugged. Some hitchhiker we picked up who knew a place to use. Maddie was her name or some shit like that. Didn't talk to her much. How'd she die? Wheatley asked. Travis took a puff of his cigarette. <sighs> Couldn't hang, I guess. Think she croaked like a couple days after we got there? Dewey wrapped her in a sheet. I shook my head. And you didn't think to call anyone for help? Travis looked at me quizzically. No, sir, he said with contempt. I guess I was too high. I didn't have anything to do with that bitch. I I'm sorry. Am I a suspect? She OD'd, man. Happens all the time. Wheatley slammed his hands on the desk. Damn it, Travis. Why was she laid in the room with those candles and all that blood on the walls? Travis leaned back in his seat and put out his cigarette. Dewey and Crystal were into some weird stuff. I didn't do nothing. Wait. Lawyer. Yes, sir. I'd like a lawyer now, please. I believe I know my rights, Sheriff. Wheatley sighed and gestured for Stevens to take Travis back to his cell. Bring in the next one. Dewey Silva was brought in next, around 2 a.m. He shifted back and forth in his seat and wouldn't make eye contact with us. Dewey, like Travis, had been in and out of jail since he was 16. He also had a warrant out in Paco County for armed robbery. We got all night, son, Wheatley said, lighting another cigarillo. I don't care about anything else right now. We just want to know about the girl. Who was she, Dewey? Dewey kept shifting and put his head in his hands before whimpering. I, I don't, don't know. His teeth started to chatter. We found her near Waller. I didn't want to pick her up, but Crystal... Dewey trailed off and began to mutter nonsense to himself. What did Crystal want, son? Dewey shut his eyes and shook his head violently. Dewey? Wheatley said calmly. We got a dead girl here, and we just want to know what happened. That girl may have a family out there. It's worried for her. Help us, and maybe I'll talk to the sheriff in Paco. Dewey began to sob and went on a diatribe about Crystal. Long before they met Travis, Crystal got her palms read by a psychic in Houston. Dewey was unimpressed by the soothsayer, but Crystal wanted to stay around Houston longer to go back. The next day, Crystal returned with an old, dusty book resembling a grimoire. She said the witch gave the book to her, but Dewey believed she swiped it. Since then, the book was all Crystal cared about. Dewey said she would only get high with him because she claimed to understand the spellbook's Latin after they smoked. What does that have to do with the girl? Wheatley asked. Dewey shook his head 
tears streaming down his face. Please help me. I didn't want to do it. Wheatley grabbed Dewey by his collar and nearly hoisted him up into the air. Answer me, Dewey. Dewey began smacking himself on the head to calm down. The girl was going to be a host. Wheatley and I raced up to the holding cells to get Crystal, but she wasn't in her cell. Stevens was slumped on the floor, unconscious. We shook him awake, but he seemed too confused to answer our questions and only pointed to the basement door, which was wide open. The basement door led down to the coroner's offices. As we descended the stairs with our weapons drawn, I felt the most overwhelming sense of dread. My legs began to feel heavy, as if my body was forcing me to turn back. All of the office doors were locked and closed, except for the morgue at the end of the hall. When we made our way down the hall, we heard voices that became louder and louder. Wheatley raced into the examiner's room and found Crystal sitting crisscrossed on the floor, repeating a chant. Her face was pointed at the ceiling, and her eyes were rolled back into the top of her head. The room began shaking violently, and the faucets in the sink turned on. Oh, fuck this, Wheatley said. He cocked his revolver, and then, with a loud bang, shot Crystal between her eyes. The room fell silent. The other deputies came running down and stopped in their tracks when they saw Crystal's body slumped on the floor. Boys, Sheriff Wheatley said calmly, let's get this place cleaned up before... The ground began to shake again, and a whistling sound attacked our ears. You're too late! A deep voice croaked, before laughing maniacally. The ground started rumbling even harder, and filing cabinets and medical supplies fell onto the floor. The lights flickered before shutting off completely. Jesus Christ! Wheatley yelled. And then everything stopped, and the room became deathly quiet, like all the sound had been sucked out of the earth. The lights flickered back on again. My eyes darted across the room to the morgue cabinets. Without a sound, one of the cabinets opened slowly by itself. The dead girl's body flopped out of the cabinet and slithered slowly toward me, rising off the ground like a snake. The girl studied me up and down before glaring at me. Allow with me, wind! Or I shall condemn thee to eternal torment. She hissed at me in a voice that was anything but human. The thing slithered out of the room and up the stairs, leaving a trail of bile behind it. The five of us stared at each other, unable to muster our words. Sheriff Wheatley took the cigarillo out of his front pocket and struggled to light it. He took a long puff and then closed his eyes. Boys, let's get the hell out of here. We all immediately found our legs and jolted back up the stairs. The thing was gone. The trail it left stopped at the front door to the station, which was cracked open. We wrapped Crystal's body in a sheet and dumped her in the lake. We released Dewey and Travis, and told them they were dead men if they ever came back. The coroner didn't ask questions when we told him the body was missing. The county didn't pay him enough for extra trouble. We continued on with our lives, arresting shoplifters and giving speeding tickets to distracted travelers. None of us ever went back to the McCullen house. Still, Every now and then, old Sonia Morris will call our station to inform us that strange noises and smells were coming from the McCullen house. I always tell her, we'll send someone out to investigate, but I never do. That house is nothing but mischief. 
It sounds like those two miscreants really conjured up some trouble. I imagine it's only a matter of time before things get worse. Evil has a way of spreading out, you see. If you enjoyed this story, please check out the author at the link below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more haunting tales like this one. And whatever you do, don't fall asleep.